Earlier I hinted that describing a traveling pulse as a bunch of normal modes would lead to some insight. So now let's see what that insight is. It's related to how the pulse falls apart. Usually in these strings when I launch the pulse they have pretty sharp corners. Okay? And if we now look at a few after they've traveled a while, you can see you really start to lose those sharp corners. And you can actually see the pulses pretty much fall apart into a jumble of oscillations. Now there could be <coughs> several reasons for this. Um, it could be simply damping. You know, there's some energy loss in this medium. You would expect that the pulse will go down and you'll lose it. But if damping were the only mechanism, then all the Fourier components would basically stay together and go down together and you would just get a smaller sharp pulse. But you don't get a smaller sharp pulse, the whole thing just kind of falls apart in time. The second thing causing it could be nonlinearity. Okay, so superposition works and all these sinusoids add up nicely only if the equation describing the motion is linear. We got a linear equation of motion, but we also assumed small angles and small deflections of the string. And that's certainly not what we have, right? We're putting almost 30, 45 degree angles in this string. So it could be nonlinearity is getting us, but there's a third thing that's actually not quite so hard to deal with that we can definitely talk about, and it's called dispersion. So here is just a get you started definition of dispersion. It's that sinusoids travel at different speeds in the medium. So the sinusoids we put together to make this pulse and make them go, they won't stay in the shape of a pulse if they all go off their own speed, right? They have to stay together. Now you may say this doesn't sound right because we derived a wave equation and it looked like this, d2y dx2 equals one over v squared d2y dt2. And that's a constant because v was the square root of the tension over the mass density. Right? And we even did a demonstration where we checked it. We put a known tension, known mass density. We watched the pulse go by, measured its speed. Everything was fine. So it appeared that all sinusoids go at the same speed. So if we have dispersion, it's not real strong. They might have been going at slightly different speeds that we couldn't detect. So let's see if there's any basis for this, where dispersion would come from. We certainly didn't get it when we did this derivation, but what did we put into this? All we put in was the tension of the string. Nothing about the size of the string, or the weight of the string, nothing like that. All we said was it's a string and the only forces we considered was the tension force. So now let's look at it again and add another force. That was one end and that was the other end and this had a tension that way and this had a tension that way and it was the, really the difference between those tensions that gave us this. But now we're gonna do the stiff string. In reality, this string has some cross-sectional area and it's made out of some material that wants to be straight. Right? It's an elastic material. If you bend it, it would rather unbend. It would rather not be curved. When it's straight, um, all along its cross-section, all the pieces of elastic are at the same, uh, uh, under the same stress, and when you bend it, there's some, these side is compressed and this side is expanded and it would rather not be. So what this does is leads to another force that we did not consider before. So if this little piece is bent, then there's a little force you can think of as being here. I'll put F for stiffness and there's a little force pulling it back here, F for stiffness. It wants to come back and be straight. So we have to derive the equation when we have tension plus Stiffness. Okay, well, let's see. So we're not going to take quite as much time as we did before. It's uh, T times D2Y DX2. So that aspect doesn't change, right? And there should be a delta X here, but I took the delta X from the other side. You'll see in a minute. And then we need the stiffness force. And this is the stiffness force. E times I times D4 y dx4, okay? So this 
is Young's modulus. This is the inherent stiffness of the material. This is the second moment of inertia. And it's equal to pi r to the fourth if you have a, a circular cross section. So the force pulling it back, it depends on the curvature of the curvature. Let me just finish the equation. Equals mu d2y dt2. So to drive this gets fairly deep into continuum mechanics, and we don't want to get into it. But I can kind of describe it a little bit. The reason there's such a high uh, derivative with space is it depends on this curvature, but also how that curvature is changing as you go across the uh, as you go across the material. That's why you end up with such a high derivative there. So we can rearrange a little bit. Let's get d2y dt2 by itself on this side equals, and let's pull out, so the mu uh, is going to come under, and we're going to pull out a tension over mu, because that's v squared. Right? That's the v from back when we had a nice constant velocity. Um, uh, and that is going to be times d2y dx2. And then minus, and because, yeah, we pulled the tension under here and then pulled it out. And minus, we'll usually just write an alpha here. Alpha d4y dx4, where alpha equals ei over t. Yeah. Alpha is kind of a unitless parameter we'll look at in a minute. ei, Young's modulus, second moment over tension. So here is our stiff string wave equation. It's still linear, OK? So it's linear as long as all the derivatives are at first order, or, or you know, to the first power. So that's a d2y dt2, first power, first power, first power, even though it's a fourth order derivative. Um, so it's not that it's nonlinear. It's just different. So now we'll plug in an answer and see what happens. 